Hi there, my name is Jonathan McIntosh and in this video I would like to talk to you about um, central Javanese gamelan music. So a best place, the best place to start this video would be to define what a gamelan ensemble is. And the American ethnomusicologist Andy Sutton defines a gamelan ensemble as, quote, a set of instruments unified by their tuning, and often decorated with carving and painting. This is a good definition because it also demonstrates that a gamelan is a collection of instruments. Um, in many ways, like a, a Western symphony orchestra, for example, where all the instruments play together uh, in order to, to produce the music. In a gamelan ensemble, all considers all players are considered to be equal. And um, this is a, a very kind of good way of trying to promote a sense of equality in the ensemble. In reality, however, some instruments do play leadership roles within the ensemble. However, these leadership roles tend to be downplayed by stressing the overall importance of the group rather than the individual. And writing in the 1930s, um, the ethnomusicologist Colin McPhee states about gamelan music that the general effect does not depend so much upon the excellence of the individual as upon the unity of the group. Again, this quote helps to reinforce the notion that um, ensemble playing is very important in the context of gamelan music. And as I was saying, some instruments do play um, leading roles within a gamelan ensemble, and the various instruments within a gamelan ensemble also have different roles um, in order to help the music hang together. And I'm now going to introduce the various instruments um, and tell you about the roles that they play in a central Javanese gamelan ensemble. This is a typical arrangement of um, a gamelan in central Java, and this illustration comes from a chapter by the ethnomusicologist Margaret Cartomi. This is a typical arrangement for a slendro pelog Javanese gamelan. Slendro and pelog are two terms that denote tuning systems that are used in relation to gamelan music. And a full gamelan ensemble will have a set of instruments in slendro and then a set of instruments in pelog. There are some instruments, however, that share slendro pelog tuning, and we'll talk about them as we discover them in this video. Slendro um, is a tuning system that has five tones, whereas pelog is a tuning system that has seven tones. And an easy way to remember that is Slendro has seven letters that has five tones, whereas Pelog has five letters that has seven tones. And the word tone denotes a musical pitch. Slendro, the five tones in Slendro tend to more or less be equidistant, which means that the interval between each of the five tones or pitches is roughly more or less the same. Whereas in Pelog, you have large and small intervals um, between some of the notes. So let's move on to talk about the instruments that are portrayed in this figure on the screen. Well, first I want to talk about instruments that help underline the musical structure of gamelan compositions. And the instruments that help underline the musical structure are various gongs of um, all different shapes and sizes. And I've highlighted suspended or hanging gongs, and we can see them there in the gong frame, um, positioned to the left-hand side of the screen as we're looking at it. And there are also other forms of gongs that are not hanging from cords on a wooden rack, but are cradled um, gongs that are um, suspended over 
pieces of cord in wooden boxes. And we can see them on the right hand side of the highlighted rectangle there. So the most important instrument in a central Javanese gamelan ensemble are the largest gongs in the orchestra. And these are called gong a gang. A gang means big or great in Javanese. Sometimes there are two gong again in a gamelan ensemble. Um, however, there might just be one gong again. It doesn't really matter. You can see from this screen um, the front and back of a gong again. And on the front side, you can see this golden sticky out bit in the middle of the gong. This golden sticky out bit is called the boss, B O double S. And you strike the gong with a large padded mallet um, just below the center point of this boss. Gong gangs are also important because the spirit of the gamelan is believed to reside inside of the large gong. And this is why gongs are often given offerings of flowers or fruit uh, as a sign of respect towards the spirit that lives inside the gong. And if a gong is ever washed, the water is believed to have healing powers and is, is kept and stored. Another type of gong that's used uh, in a Japanese gamelan ensemble are gong suwukan. And they are gongs that are not as large as the gong again, but they are important because they mark particular points in, in the music. And um, you can see that they are highlighted here in blue uh, rectangles on the screen. A form of chime gong. So these are gongs that sit on um, cord in the wooden boxes I was talking about earlier, are kanong. And you can see that they have a boss, but it's a kind of sticky out bit from the top of the chime gong. And um, these mark um, primary points of importance in the music. Another type of suspended hanging gong are kampul. And you can see that I've highlighted the kampul in the blue rectangle on the screen here. Now, Kampul is used to refer to one gong, but it can also be used to refer to many gongs here. Kampul uh, mark secondary points of importance in gamelan structure, and they, because they're smaller gongs, they produce a higher sounding pitch than the gong, so we can, um, and, uh, when, and then also much higher than the gong again, which produces the lowest sound, the lowest pitch sound in a gamelan ensemble. Two other small chime gongs that are important when it comes to underlining um, the musical structure are the katuk and the kampyang. The kampyang produces a very high pitch and the katuk produces a slightly dull um, sound. And it produces this dull sound because as we can see on the next slide, when we look at a cross section of the instrument, it has, a, it has a flat top to it, with the boss barely rising from um, the top of the gong. This produces this dull um, sound. It's still a very important sound within um, the gamelan ensemble, but um, making the gong in this way helps to produce and differentiate the sound. And this is compared with a cross section of a canon, um, where we can see that the sides of the canon are elevated and then the boss is raised much more on top of the chime gong. So these are the instruments that help underline the structure of gamelan music. And then we have instruments that abstract the melody or instruments that play the core notes um, that help form a melody in gamelan music. And these instruments are highlighted in the red um, rectangle on the screen. So instruments that abstract the melody include sarong type instruments. And I've included two sarongs on this screen, the sarong barong and the sarong de mong. 
Sarongs have um, bronze, me bronze bars that are placed over wooden cases and there's a, a trough inside the case that's hollowed out to produce a kind of sound chamber and the sound emanates from um, this trough. The barong is a medium uh, metallophone and it's one octave higher than the large Saron de Mong. Another instrument that plays the ab or abstracts the melody is the slentum. And the slentum uh, has uh, bronze keys, but they are slightly thinner than the keys used for the saddle. And they also have a ridge, um, a kind of wave shape uh, that runs across the key. This is not a trough instrument. It's called a gantung metallophone. And gantung um, refers to the fact that underneath each of the, the keys, the, the gold bars, the bronze bars that you can see on this lantern, there's a long tube that runs down from each key. And this tube is called gantung. It's the style um, of making the instrument. And the sound um, reverberates down the tube like this. You can't see these tubes um, on this picture of the slanton because um, there's a decorative a wooden um, plate in front, um, but they're there. And that helps to produce the slightly softer sound for the slanton when compared with the Saron Baron or De Mon. Talking about the nature of a trough metallophone, um, on this slide you can actually see that I've taken some of the bronze bars off of the Saron de Mon, and you can see um, the hollowed out trough or chamber in um, the wooden uh, case of the instrument. And that's what denotes the Saron uh, and how it's called a trough metallophone. Next, I would like to talk about instruments that mediate the melody. Um, and the, there are three instruments from the Kartomi illustration that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is the Saron Panarus, which you can see to the far right hand side of the screen, and then instruments to the top left of the illustration, and these are called Bonang instruments. So let's talk about the Slentum, uh, not the Slentum, the Saron Panarus first, which is the instrument to the right of the screen. The Saron Panarus is made in the same way as the Saron Baron and the Saron de Mon. It's a trough metallophone. However, um, it's an octave higher than the Saron Baron, and it produces a very high-pitched sound. You can see from the picture on the right-hand side of the screen with the three Sarons in it. Um, I've included this to demonstrate um, the, the size of each of the Saron instruments. So, at the top of this picture, the large instrument is the Saron Baron, and it has very wide um, bronze keys. And then you can see in the middle the Saron Baron, and then at the bottom the Saron de Mon. So the smaller the keys, the higher the pitch of the instrument. Other uh, instruments that elaborate or um, uh, fulfill a similar role to that of um, the Saron Panarus are um, instruments called Bonang. And these are um, sets of chime gongs that are um, suspended on wooden cord, on, on um, cord um, that's rigged in between kind of um, wooden bases. So they kind of look like beds with um, these chime gongs on them. The Bonang Panarus is the higher of the two sets of Bonang, and the Bonang Barung is the lower in the two sets here. And with the Saron Panarus, these instruments use the melody in a way to um, devise particular patterns that are used um, to play fast moving parts um, on top of the melody. Finally, I would like to talk about instruments that elaborate um, the melody. And there's quite a few of these in a gamelan ensemble. So let's um, take them one by one and discuss them. The first is an instrument known as gender. 
And like the Gendel is like the Slentum in that it's a Gandung metallophone. But Gendel has 14 thin ridged metal keys. And it has this number of keys um, because players, it's the only um, kind of metal keyed instrument in a gamelan ensemble that players play with two hands. Um, in the left hand, the player usually plays uh, the melody where they will play elaborating patterns with the right hand. And you can see the two small mallets that are used to play the gender in the picture on the screen. The names of the two gender are the gender panarus and the gender barum. Just like in terms of the saron panarus and the bonan panarus, the gender panarus is an octave higher, so it denotes the higher instrument, and gender barum is the lower um, of the two gender in a gamelan ensemble. The gumbang is a type of wooden xylophone instrument that elaborates the melody. It has a very broad range, as you can see from looking at the picture on the screen. The first of the string instruments that are used in a gamelan ensemble is the rebab. And the rebab is a type of spike fiddle instrument. And it actually descends from an instrument in, that originates in um, Afghanistan called a rubab. Um, but this is called a rubab. It's called a spike fiddle because the player um, sits the instrument on its spike, as you can see in the bottom there. and um, player plays notes with the left hand and both the rebab with the right hand. There's one string that goes from the top all the way down the front of the instrument, around the foot, and then back up to the top of the instrument. So it's one string, but in effect there are two strings um, used. Uh, the rebab uh, is a very important melodic leader in a gamelan ensemble. There are two other types of string instruments. Um, that you might hear in gamelan recordings, and that are included in um, the figure in the article by Margaret Cartomi. These instruments are the zitter and the chalampong. Um, the zitter is the smaller of these two instruments, and it has uh, lots of metal, string, uh, metal strings that are um, placed across a signboard and the metal strings are plucked with um, the fingernails. The chalampung is a, a bigger instrument that has a lower pitch, and it's also played by using um, the fingernails. Zitters tend to be much more common in Central Javanese gamelan music and gamelan recordings than chalampung. There's also a, a woodwind instrument or an aerophone instrument that's used in um, Central Javanese Gamelan Ensemble, and this is um, a, a suling, uh, which is a type of duct aerophone, and it's duct because of the, the notch, as we can see here on one of the slide, the pictures on the slide, um, that helps to produce the sound. And then finally, we have vocal parts. Um, that are integral to um, gamelan music. So there's a male chorus, which is called a gerong, and the male chorus tends to sing a part that is um, quite set in relation to the musical structure. And we have a female vocalist called a pasindan. In the picture on the screen here, you can see a group of pasindan, but in performance, only one of the singers would sing at any one time. Unlike the part that the male singers perform, Sindhans have much more freedom and flexibility in how they perform their part in relation to the other instruments. Another type of instrument are instruments that help regulate time in a gamelan ensemble. And these are usually drums within um, the orchestra. So drums, uh, also known as gundan, uh, which is the general term for drum, although drums have specific names. Drums regulate the gamelan music 
and they help to drive the music in terms of tempo changes or signaling that a piece of music is about to finish. And usually when a piece of music is about to finish, the drummer will play a specific signal and the music will gradually slow down towards the end. Drums tend to be, um, most of the drums tend to be barrel shaped and this means that they have two skins, one at either side of the drum and one of the drum heads and the skins tends to be much larger than the other side. So it produces a kind of bulge shape that's called a barrel shape. The four main types of drums are um, the large kandang gandeng, medium kandang chiblon or chiblon, the small ketipon, and then um, a drum known as a bedug. So here are the gandeng and the ketipon, and in performance these two drums are often used together, uh, and the drummer um, plays between the ginding and the ketipun. You can see that the large ginding um, drum, you can see the large face that's actually facing us. And then it has a smaller face on the other side. And the two faces of the drums are connected um, by cords, which is usually leather. Um, and these cords are tightened by moving notches. You can see a notch in the middle of the drum there um, towards the larger side of the drum. And this then tightens the leather and helps produce a higher pitch or helps to tune the drum. The Kindan Chiblon is also on a stand and it's a kind of medium sized drum and it would be used um, particularly in puppet performances and also to accompany certain sections of dance performances. The bedug actually is not a barrel-shaped drum and normally is, um, it normally sits in a special stand. Um, it's used sparingly in gamelan compositions and sometimes not at all in some, um, some pieces of gamelan music. Interestingly, the badug is actually the only instrument that's been appropriated um, in Islamic practice, um, and it's often uh, badug can often be seen um, in mosques across um, Java, and it would be used as a warning signal or to summon people to come um, to mosque for particular occasions. In this slide, um, that I've, the picture that I've included here, it demonstrates the pitch and range of some of the instruments um, that I've discussed so far in the video. So we can see that the Saron Panarus, for example, um, at the top of um, the x-axis, the y-axis, sorry, it has a very high pitch, whereas the Gong Gang at the bottom of the list has the lowest pitch in the Gamelan Ensemble. This doesn't include instruments such as the chalampong or the baduk. Gamelan instruments in Java are also uh, categorized according to whether they are loud or whether they are soft instruments. Loud playing instruments um, would always be used for playing outside uh, and they tend to be the metal sounding instruments um, and the drums in a gamelan ensemble. Um, where softer playing instruments would include the metallophones with the thinner keys, such as the gander, and um, the wooden xylophone, the sulin, um, other uh, string instruments, such as the chalampong sitter and rabab, as well as singing parts. Softer playing instruments are used more for inside performances, but this doesn't mean um, that um, some of the soft playing instruments are, not, are never included in ensembles that perform outside. So there's a great flexibility in gamelan music performances, and instruments can be rearranged depending on the number of players that are present, and also the context in which the music is performed. 
And finally, this slide um, shows how we can classify uh, instruments in a central Javanese gamelan according to the Hornbostel sax system of airphones, chordophones, idiophones, and membranophones. So most of the instruments in a Javanese gamelan are idiophones. And um, I've included towards the end of the slide um, the vocal parts that don't necessarily fit in the Hornbostel sax system.